think is that um, you you suggested this very interesting um, thing in the uh, in the Slack chat a few weeks ago, which uh, had to do with uh, trying to figure out what an appropriate sampling regime was for your experiment. And it, in my world, there are two ways to to think about um, quantitatively about how much uh, how many samples you're going to collect or what your sample size is. One way is the traditional way. And that's to perform a power analysis uh, if we're going to do it quantitatively. And the other way is to uh, do a do a simulation. And so I was really interested to see that uh, even though we've never talked about it in here, you you've performed a simulation to explore your sample size. So I'm very excited to see. And without further ado, I'll, I'll um, relinquish the screen to you. Tell us about it, please. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, one explanation is that perhaps I couldn't do a power analysis in any, any other way, so <laughs> this is why I resorted to simulation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let me try and um, share my screen. Mm -hmm. All right, one moment. Okay. Can you see what can you see now? Is it a full uh, full uh, a screen? Full screen looks perfect. Right. Fine, good. So that's going to be justifying a sample size with a Poisson based simulation, but of course in a, uh, when when we think that the data uh, have a different um, a different distribution uh, we could use a different um, distribution for the simulation too. All right, so the research, the task the researcher has is to find the mean number of plants per unit length of row on a field that, that looks like that. Um, I have marked a plot uh, here, and let's say that we want to know the plant stand. And, and there are, uh, of course, um, similar problems uh, in ecology like uh, counting uh, organisms or um, events that happen in time. It will be all similar. Uh, but let's think about this uh, shape of a field. And um, of course, we could um, uh, we could um, count all plants, but this is too uh, high a workload. So we have to sample. And you, what we usually do is something like that. Uh, we've got the plant rows. Uh, we take a stick uh, that has some length, put it on the field, uh, count the plants that um, are adjacent, adjacent to the um, stick and repeat that procedure. Um, so, uh, so that we get a sum of um, all um, uh, of the counted plants and the total length of the stick uh, from this, we calculate the mean number of plants per unit length of row. For whatever reasons, we want to um, we want to do that. Um, and this is an, our estimation of the uh, sample mean. And now, uh, the data from with some assumptions as to the spatial or temporal distribution, the data from counting follow a Poisson distribution. Uh, that is given just by one parameter, the mean uh, lambda here. Um, the mean, uh, th this distribution uh, is so nice that lambda is also a variation. Uh, so it's given basically by one parameter. Uh, and please note that I am using, uh, introducing the Poisson distribution, I'm using uh, K and lambda because this is usually what we can find in places like Wikipedia. Uh, but I will be using a slightly different variable names in my scripts. Uh, K is X and lambda is MT for some reasons I will explain. Uh, let's have a look at what the shape of the Poisson distribution is. Uh, it is uh, slightly asymmetric. Uh, and uh, it uh, has a maximum around the mean. So this is for uh, mean 5, this one is for mean 10, this is for 20, and this is for 30. Again, this is all the same scale. All right. Um, so the problem is to find the optimal length of the 
of that transect of that stick. Uh, and what does it mean optimal? Not too long because of workload and not too short uh, because of course we have some uh, requirements as to the precision. For example, we want to detect slight differences, small differences between two uh, treatments. Um, and uh, there is also another formulation of that problem. We are interested in the relationship between um, the length of the transect, uh, between uh, the length of the transect, the number of transects we have to uh, take uh, at a required accuracy, uh, the mu, that is the mean on the field, is something we have to live with. Uh, this is a constant for us. And of course, what is the p-value for the measurements? Um, before we, um, I present the code, uh, let's recap the parameters. L is the transect length, N is the number of observations in a sample, X is the number of plants on a transect, mu is the global mean, that's the number of plants per unit length of row, and we have to pre-estimate it somehow. Um, MT will be, because I, I want to differ be, to differentiate between the mu and the MT. Uh, the transect can be shorter or longer and L, the length of the transect, is uh, just the proportionality constant between MT and MU. M is the approximation of real MT from survey uh, at required accuracy D uh, at required P value. Uh, the, uh, uh, the variables we want to tweak here is the transect length and the number of observations. And uh, I've got a comment that uh, for me, mostly it was a transect length because sometimes uh, N can be implied by the structure of the experiment. You've got a field of a uh, given shape and you've got uh, plots with a given number of uh, rows. Uh, but sometimes in uh, biology you can uh, have a, a completely different situation where it, it, it will be more practical to um, change the number of observations. Uh, for instance, when you um, take samples of water and are trying to find some uh, parasite in that, uh, you've got, uh, it's not practical to take a lot of water and uh, drag it to uh, the lab, you usually take it uh, in smaller portions. Um, so there will be two scripts uh, to present. One is testing uh, these assumptions that the data, real life data, have Poissonian distribution. Uh, and it was, uh, it will be using uh, two data sets from my experimental site. Uh, to obtain uh, one data set, a tape measure was placed, uh, as you can see in the right uh, bottom corner, a tape measure was placed along the rows of plants, spring bean it was, and the position of individual plants uh, was written down. Uh, and we will use this numeric form of a plant row uh, to draw a sample. Then we will compare the histogram shape with a histogram generated by R. Uh, the function R poise uh, with the same mean. And the other data set is that one uh, on the uh, top right corner. Mm, it, uh, 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 these are directly results of countings uh, of plants mm, uh, as a germination uh, survey. And again, we will look at uh, the histograms. All right, so um, let's come back to teams i would like to show you the code now oops okay all right can you see our studio yeah looks good fine so um Script number one, Poisson assumption testing. Uh, let's read the data in. This is a, uh, a data frame containing uh, plant positions and the number of row it was taken. And now just a short moment of preparation of this data. Uh, let's take a moment to prepare this data. 
let's simply click through this. I'm merging the, the seven rows into one. One long row of uh, plants. The length, um, the, the number of plants is 862 on 11,000 centimeters. So it's uh, more than 100 meters of length. So this is a, a row that uh, is composed of seven, uh, but made into one to uh, facilitate sampling. And uh, let's see if there were uh, if the differences between the individual rows weren't too uh, too large. I think just have a look at that um, plot. I think it was okay, and uh, we can check the uh, coefficient of variation, which is around seven percent. So I think it was reasonable to. Uh, without further reasoning, I think it was okay to merge these plots into one. And and now what we are doing? We are sampling from that plot, uh, from that uh, plant row. Uh, let the transect length uh, be a uh, hundred centimeters because the the unit here is a centimeter. So let's take one meter stick, and let's simulate over five thousand transects. And the procedure here is like putting the stick on that row randomly using the function runif. Um, and the results are counts of plants that fall on the uh, stick. Let's have a look at the histogram. Can you see it correctly? This is the histogram from the real distribution. And let's see how many plants were all together sampled. 38,000 uh, plants uh, because, of course, it's a, uh, it was uh, sampled multiple um, times from the same row. Now, let's see, let's compare this shape of the histogram with the histogram that will be generated by uh, the function rpoise. This is here. Um, let's prepare uh, the mu for that function and mean number of plants per transect length. And let's have a look at the histogram. This is the simulated distribution. Let's compare it with the real one. It's almost identical. So just see that. Uh, oh, and the sum of plants is also 38,000 something and the difference between the numbers of plants is very very uh, very very tiny something to minus five minus fifth the power um, it, please note that here uh, in the in that second um, distribute in that second simulation uh, I was directly using uh, uh, our function our poise that simulates sampling with Poissonian distribution, while uh, the earlier one wasn't directly using this function, but the Poissonian distribution was obtained by sampling. Uniform sampling from my real data. This is almost identical. And now uh, I have another way to compare those two plots by uh, the, the histograms are as line plots presented as line plots now. OK, so uh, have you got any questions as to this script? Any questions, anyone? I'm good. You're going quite fast even for me, uh, Prismek, but I've just about, I think, kept up with you. <laughs> so if, if anyone okay. else has any good. questions. Good. Uh, we, we, we can shortly go again <laughs> through this. <laughs> yeah, very I, good. I, I just have one very short question, I think. Um, so uh, the, the mean for your Poisson distribution, it, it's, it's under 10. And I think there's some sort of um, rule of thumb, isn't there, that you have to keep the number down. Otherwise, it just sort of becomes like more like a normal distribution of the higher, higher numbers. Did, did that play into your selection of the length of your measuring stick? Um, 
I I simply took the, the almost the same um, uh, um, the measuring stick that is um, we were using a half a meter stick on the, uh, on the real data, uh, not exactly on this data with um, with some uh, with the spring bean, uh, but for um, sampling um, from uh, cereals. Uh, for uh, spring beans, it was three or four meters, depending on uh, on the or five meters, depending on the field. Um, I wasn't looking. It, in fact, this is uh, this should be completely should have, should have been the other way around uh, because only now I am doing this sort of power analysis uh, with the, the practice of using a half a meter stick established. <laughs> so I didn't think about um, uh, about creating a um, a histogram that is as um, uh, as close as possible to the normal. Um, to the normal um, distribution, uh, but it is a very good question for a different reason. If I may follow with that now, uh, uh, well, what was done until now? We had uh, we had plots with different treatments, and we were trying to find differences between the treatments and. As a standard, it was done with ANOVA, and now ANOVA, th that standard ANOVA, has a um, assumption that your data are normally distributed, while obviously data from uh, that are uh, Poissonian distributed are not normally distributed. Um, but the uh, I think that even for not very high um, uh, n. Uh, the shape of the uh, the shape of the distribution is so similar to is is more similar to normal than many badly behaved data where you just close your eyes and say okay this is normal ish so uh, using poissonian distribution in place of um, in place of normal distribution uh, isn't bad isn't bad because the shape is really similar I come in and just make a comment um, is that um, there's a there's a well really two comments these are kind of important comments to keep in mind now for your data that you've simulated here um, your data are similar looking your raw data are similar looking to Gaussian um, and there's a property that the Poisson distribution has that um, and, and we could show it with simulation quite easily. You could you could play with this. I have I have talked about this in previous meetings. Is that as the mean of the um, Poisson distribution, a true theoretical Poisson distribution, as the mean increases, you get up to about mm -hmm. um, ten or more than ten, and it's very close then to the Gaussian. And your mean is it looks like around uh, six or seven. Uh, you know, it's it's approaching Gaussian, but you do have that long tail out there. Uh, so yeah, it's close. Uh, is it close enough? This is this is actually subjective. Um, this is actually subjective. But the the thing that I wanted to um, also say is that the, the assumption we make with the the general linear model. Um, you know, a specific version of that would be like analysis of variance is um, it, we don't make the assumption that the, the raw data are, are Gaussian, but we make the assumption that the residuals are Gaussian. And uh, when we make a diagnostic plot based on a, a NOVA model, um, what would happen, let, let's say that you had a, a, a situation a bit more extreme than your data where it may be, um, it's skewed a little bit like what we're looking at now, or maybe it's a little bit more extreme. Uh, and, and we calculated the residuals from a from a, an ANOVA. What we'd find is that um, for um, for some of the values around the range of predictions, the ANOVA model would make predictions just fine for new data, but for extreme values, um, it wouldn't be accurate. And that, that's where we violate the assumption of ANOVA for count for count data, uh, usually. So those are those are a few fine points to make about that. Um, 
have to keep in mind about the um, the specific assumption we're making. It's about the residuals, not necessarily the the raw data. Uh, and last thing is you could do actually a statistical test. You have quite a lot of data, so um, I, I don't think you would find a difference maybe, but you could use the, um, there's a test called the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a, it's a um, classic test to compare distributions and um, it, it would be appropriate, you know, you could, you could add it to this for rigor if you wanted to, to just put a point on whether or not your simulated versus real distribution is different to each other. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, those are some fine, fine points to put on it. Can I, can I ask a more general question? Um, stepping back from the simulation, just a second is, um, if you were thinking about the sample size, minimizing your effort is very good practice. Um, what, what kind of, um, what is the thing you're measuring that you're really interested in? And um, what made you um, collect the amount of data that you have been collecting before you've started thinking about this simulation. Could you talk about that just a little bit? Uh, yes, let's let's just uh, uh, I would like to show quickly uh, at the end of this script because this is the this, uh, assumption testing. Uh, I would like to show you two different uh, set, data sets and then sure. we will sh see a different uh, shape of distribution. So let's just uh, uh, let's just uh, click through this quickly. Uh, this is this is uh, uh, emergence data uh, from 2019, and it's slightly different than before. Uh, just a moment. Let, let me uh, clear it up for just for safety. Okay. Mm. What we've got here. This is a real distribution from uh, germination survey data. And this is um, a histogram of a simulated Poisson distribution based on the same mean from from that uh, uh, from that data. So let's compare. This is the real distribution. This is simul, and this one is simulated uh, around the same mean. And here the difference is more pronounced. And if we use a subset of data from a different year, just look here this uh, real simulation from 2021 a uh, real distribution from 2021 isn't so similar to uh, Poissonian let's make the Poissonian one 2021 simulated uh, uh, Poissonian simulated around the mean from 2021 and the real data and we've got a problem with these uh, lots of zeros here so this is what you're Saying that we can, we cannot always assume that um, the, the, the the spatial distribution is such that the data are Poissonian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that's that's a real problem. Can you show your real data distribution again? Uh, it's like the previous one. That's the one, 2021. This um this to me looks like a um well. What would fit better than a Poisson distribution would be that um, a really annoying distribution to to model statistically zero inflated Poisson or zero inflated negative binomial would probably fit that better than either Poisson or something different. Yeah, that's annoying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, anyway, uh, the. There's just a run-of-the-mill uh, modeling would just use an ANOVA and say this uh, this is different and this isn't different. But I wanted to see what it <laughs> looks like a little behind the scenes. All right, but uh, now let's uh, I will show you the script that makes the uh, this uh, um, that outputs uh, the, a table which contains. Uh, p values for a given um, for a given um, mean mu for a given number of transects for a given transect number but here we've got a uh, here we've got a, a range of these because this is uh, the, the intention is to make a table and a range of 
um, accuracy, a range of precisions we want. Um, let's clear the table again. OK, and what this thing is doing? Let's read these constants in. And make dummy um, dummy vectors and dummy matrices for um, for the results of uh, the simulations. And now this loop here is simulating a student that was taking n samples uh, and n transects for thousand years. I think it is here. I was using ten thousand earlier, but uh, it was uh, running longer. So uh, this is a thousand years worth of a student that is taking um, Poissonian distributed uh, samples. OK, let's go. Good. We've got that done and now we are calculating P value. Um, here. In this uh, in these brackets. Uh, is the condition that the simulated um, mean M is to be between uh, the MU by uh, by a factor of D. So it, uh, it I calculate all these that are larger than uh, MT minus uh, MT times D and those that are smaller than uh, MT uh, plus uh, mt times d. Did I run this loop? Not yet. All right. And let's see the result. In this column, we've got a mu. This is uh, a constant for the simulation. N is also a constant. But here you can see a range of uh, uh, transect length. If the unit is one meter, then this is 10 centimeters, this is 15 centimeters, and so on and so on, up to, I think, two meters here. And uh, these are, uh, one moment, let's, all names here. Okay. And these, these are uh, accuracies, 1%, 2%, up to 10%. And this field of that table contains p values. Uh, rather than looking at uh, this here at the drab image in our studio, I can show you the. Um, I will show you um, an XLS file with that. moment the computer is creaking under load with many applications open we should never have mercy on computers make them work for it yeah well it is working but it is not the fastest uh, I think it's rather a miracle that it's still alive <laughs> because this is a computer which used to have Windows 8 on that uh, installed. So it's like eight years now. <laughs> still running strong. OK, trying to share. OK, can you see the result in full color now? Yep, yep. OK, so. Unit, den unit density is that mu. I call it unit density here. Um, that's the mean number of plants. For the example with the field, it's the mean number of plants per meter, say. And here is the number of transects. The students took a sample uh, of 200 transects. And for a given transect length, which is in that column, we are getting p-value for a given accuracy. That is departure from the true unit density by no more than 1%, 2%, 3%, and so on. 
Okay. Um, so can you explain the accuracy a little bit? It, it's um, important and I'm not sure I quite understand what the percentages are. What is the accuracy? Um, we've got the true unit density. Of course, we don't know it. We don't know it uh, on the field because we only make inference um, based on the sample, uh, based on the sampling. But it, this is something that comes from uh, the pre-estimation. So we just take a uh, uh, take a, uh, an earlier measurement, an earlier count, and we think that will be something around 50 with that unit density, and we run a simulation with that as an initial setting. Uh, number of transects. This is what you what you asked about my data. Um, when I have 48 uh, plots um, and 22 rows on each, and I want to use only a part of uh, these plots because some are in different um, uh, in different treatment, uh, we end up with some number of rows that are available on the field. So uh, it can be something like a hundred transects because we have a uh, hundred rows available. Uh, Devil is in the details here. Um, we um, we have to know something about the spatial distribution first. I do not expect any uh, differences along the row, and I can plan my transects as I want. But it is most practical for me to just count, to just go across the field uh, and collect transic, uh, collect my samples along one line because it makes it easier for me to to well to operate on the field. So uh, this is something that is related to my number of uh, plots. Um, for example, um, for example, on my um, uh, on my new hop yard field. Um, there were 48 plots and 22 rows on each one. So if we wanted to know the true mean for the whole field, that we could have a number of transects that is 48 times 22, which is more than a thousand. Um, and if we want to uh, to get a mean on a subset of these plots, it will be a smaller number. Let's say we are collecting 200 uh, plan, uh, 200 um, uh, transects. Uh, as to the accuracy, we've got that mean, which is 50, and I am counting uh, those um, those results of counting the mean that fall into uh, uh, into the range of unit density minus and plus one percent minus and plus two percent and so on because uh, we will never get uh, the exact value it always has to be a range i see so for ten percent for the unit a real unit density of 50 your estimate would be between 45 and 55 45 and 55 yes correct yeah. okay this is what i think the script is doing <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, uh, and the p-value that you've estimated there is uh, so. If you were going to design your experiment here, we see one clear thing that jumps off and out of this at me is there's a trade-off between the accuracy you achieve and the transect length. Right. That's the main yes. point of doing this. There's also diminishing returns if you look at the the way the line of green changes um, by um, where we're detecting a difference um, for shorter and shorter transect lengths. Um, yeah, let's keep going down. This is good. Yeah, okay, so we're having massive diminishing returns down here. We, we never achieve 1% error differences yeah but uh we want to yeah i see what you've done here so okay so what do you learn from this so what 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 uh, do you want to tell your supervisor about this <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, all right um in uh serials uh, the typical length was 0 0.5 meter 
let's say it's meters and the the numbers of the unit density and number of transactions are roughly reasonable here. It can be slightly different for different crops and for um, different subsets of plots, but these, these are reasonable numbers. Um, let's say it's half a meter stick. Uh, we know that if we want if we want to have a um, p value lower than um, 0, 0, 005, then we are we shouldn't be overexcited detecting differences between uh, treatments uh, being around one or two percent. We uh, with the positive uh, result of the experiment will be for um, uh, for differences between treatments higher than three or four and five per, uh, five percent. And if we go down to 0 0.3, because there was one year when uh, the transect was as short as uh, um, as uh, 30 centimeters uh, in the earlier course of um, of that long term experiment. Uh, Let's have a look. Uh, this is the area where we are below uh, 0, 0, 005 uh, only here. So 4% differences. Anything smaller than 3% uh, should be disregarded. Uh, it would be very interesting to compare these p values with p values from ANOVA run on those data when when there are differences, wherever there are differences between treatments uh, in the range of two or three percent, what were the p-values detected by the ANOVA? So that that'd be quite interesting, I think. Yeah, you could do that by simulation, I think. Um, I have another question before I, I ask uh, other people to um, to ask questions, or if you have something to finish up with. Um, but uh, if, if you look at those errors on your different columns, um, mm. is there a way to think about this problem a little differently than we've talked about it so far? Is there a way to think about it of um, what if there is a very small error between your treatments, like let's say one or two percent? Um, how big or how small does that error have to be before we stop caring about it? In other words, um, is there some limit within this uh, you know, one, two, three, maybe the lower percentage differences where um, the the difference is actually biologically uninteresting to us. Can we can we think of um, can we think of the problem in those terms? Mm -hmm. Or is one percent always going to be interesting? It it doesn't have to be always interesting. Uh, in this long term experiment. Uh, which is uh, dedicated, among other things, to crops, to, to yields um, in different uh, systems of tillage. Uh, when you think about a large uh, farm, they can be interested in differences of in yield gain as low as 1%, in fact. Uh, at least this is what the approach is um, in the supervisory team. Uh, they can be in, uh, interested in that, but uh, then uh, we, you would have to use a larger stick to report that. <laughs> of course, on number of transacts and possibly uh, in when you just lengthen the stick and take a higher number of transects, you're running out of the field. Um, the spatial structure, the variability in the field can uh, get in your way uh, before you start reporting differences as low as 1%. So this is uh, something that uh, it makes no harm to report the difference uh, as low as 1% in that case, because this is about farming. But if it was about uh, some medical uh, medical uh, research, uh, we would have to be more uh, more cautious. I don't know if it explains what you were asking. Well, yeah, no, that, that does. Uh, that makes perfect sense. You have a big field and you want to shave off a, a 
you know, very small amount can create a big efficiency if you have many, many hectares. I guess, uh, though, if you have a small effect size uh, in a field trial situation, you might run out of rows, but for those bigger fields, you wouldn't. And I guess you would design your, self, your um, data collection with blocks so that you could account for that uh, spatial heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. did, did you run any simulations with more, um, what is column B, with more uh, number, number of transects? Yes. Uh, we can run one. Because you could look at the okay. trade-off, I was thinking, between transect length and the number of transects. That's another natural one to look at the breakpoint here. Uh, so what settings would you suggest? Uh, the same unit density and a number of transects of, say, one every, transect? every Everything the same, but um, doubling the number of transects, say, or having the number of transects, just to see how it changes the color gradient you've got there, if you can drop it in like that. Okay, just give me a moment. Uh, let's uh, go up to 400 then. And might be interesting just to compare the 1% um, columns and see which row uh, those differences okay, it's show running. up. It's running. I will get the, fi the file in a moment. I think that's the one. While um, while your computer is wheezing, running that new simulation, um, a long time ago, boy, it's been a really long time ago, maybe more than two years ago, uh, we talked about um, doing sample size um, simulations like this with a program called G Power, which is the kind of experimental design power analysis tool that uh, you use in stats consulting quite a lot. Okay, so that doubling the sample size really changes the um, the breaks there quite a lot. Just a moment, I will make that the same color scale. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> this is for unit density 50, and this time there's 400 number of transects. The, this number here is very similar. It was, uh, if I remember well, that was 0, 07. Uh, I can um, perhaps I can copy that table. Yeah, or just Alt Tab between the spreadsheets in a different in the same position. We can just visually inspect them. I will stick it in here. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's effective to to see. Yeah, it affects it. Yeah, pretty strongly, I'd say. You can see how the, yeah, the the range of that green here is higher. Yeah, scroll down a little bit and let's uh, let's have a look. Yeah, so you're hitting you're hitting uh, being able to detect a small one percent difference um, with much smaller transect size. Uh -huh. Yeah. Of course, this is an artifact. Uh, this should be completely smooth. Uh, but it's a simulation and uh, and not a very strong one because we, we, I reduced the number of simulation runs down to 1,000. Um, with a very high uh, number of simulation runs, this should be smoother. Uh, there shouldn't shouldn't be any uh, any teeth like that. <laughs> any. Yeah, does anyone have any comments? I think this is very interesting. It's a nice uh, nice example of um, a custom simulation for a particular problem. It, uh, it does sidestep the requirement of doing power analysis where um, you do need to know about power analysis to do power analysis, but you also need to know about your data. Uh, here, you might have to know a little bit more about your data, but um, you only need to um, heuristically, you know, understand uh, the principles of experimental design. And I, yeah, I think it's a great, uh, really interesting uh, example of data exploration. Very powerful. How, how do you think? Um, do you think that this will impact 
experimental design and data collection for for you and your your research group mm -hmm. oh, well the problem is that in fact <laughs> we are almost over with the experiment uh, with with uh, <laughs> with my uh, research um I, this will impact my, in the case of my data it will impact uh, it is not uh, no longer able to impact the way I collect the data because I have collected them. Uh, mm. But I will be cautious to uh, report low differences. So I will be happy to see differences like 8% between the treatments, but I will not be so happy to um, to see lower differences. And especially when I because I can subset the plant rows on my field in various ways. Uh, I can subset them by treatments which are assigned to plots, but I also have analyzed mm, the internal structure of the plots. This is sort of a different um, level, uh, the internal structure, because they are trafficked in a particular way and every plant row um, undergoes a different number of uh, wheel passes in a year. Um, and I have, uh, th thanks to R, I have a way to uh, assign uh, data collected from the field to that trafficking value, to that traffic intensity. Uh, but then we have to, what it affects? It affects the number of transects because I've, if I think of, say, all uh, rows that have got five uh, wheel passes over a year, then I will no longer have 400 of these. I exactly know how many on the field uh, there are, and there may be just 100 of these. And I will then run a different simulation and see what these p-values are and what um, uh, what um, uh, differences between treatments should I dare reporting or should I dare report what, what you've done <coughs> excuse me what you've done is amazing if you could um, uh, have, have a tool uh, where you um, sort of input the unit density and and then you plot the uh, number of samples against the transact length um, and, and what you're actually plotting, uh, and and you input the the the, the p-value pre you're prepared to accept, and the so the the, the highest p-value and the lowest accuracy, uh, you then have a sort of a, a curve plotted on the graph, uh, and you could then mm -hmm. choose from that, you know, your <laughs> what what suited you as far as a uh, transact length and number of um, samples was. I don't know if it would generalize to to any any uh, field. Uh, I think it's quite general, and uh, I, I thought exactly. I thought about this. Um, uh, you can think about this simulation uh, as um, th the results of these simulations are in fact in four-dimensional space because uh, you've got one variable, you've got the other variable, and this is all we can uh, present on a flat surface. But yeah, yeah. Ah, but if you if you if you uh, choose to uh, plot out the the number against the transact length and and input your ceilings for your uh, or floor and ceiling for your p and percentage, then then you can take it back to two dimensional yes. visualization. Yes. Good. Good. This is a good idea, and I thought about uh, a slightly different uh, um, approach to that is based on these numbers just. Take all numbers from this simulation and um, make a uh, make a modeling, make a uh, not a linear modeling, uh, just make an empirical um, empirical equation. That uh, uh, um, my mathematical skills are not. Uh, uh, so good that I could make that equation straight away, taking the Poisson, ex the Poisson distribution uh, equation and just churning it around. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, I could get a lot of numbers of this type and then um, just fit a model 
and get a, a empirical equation. That would be fine. Exactly for the same purpose you are saying. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. I mean, you, either that way, or just just let the computer grunt away and do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with iteration through all the, all the possibilities at whatever mm -hmm. resolution you're interested in. Yeah, you could you could make a um, a shiny app with a 3D visualization to show. You might have several things that you wanted to to look at for experimental design. It could be the unit density, the number of transects, the transit length, and the mm -hmm. the, the uh, amount of just with, with knobs and sliders, just an app. Yeah, just an app with a shiny app. Yeah, you could you could do that. You could also make a 3D visualizations and that way you could show um, two variables that you would um, that you would um, vary at a time and then of course the the z axis the third axis would be the uh, the statistical power or the p, the p value something like that mm -hmm. um guys i have to i have to go 5 minutes early i invite you to carry on without me thank you so much prismek this is fascinating i think that thank you. Um, this approach is very powerful um we uh if you're interested in playing with it i think matt's question is a very important one um, where he was kind of suggesting, do you think, in my words, uh, are there other cereal, uh, cereal farmers that would be interested in this? Uh, you know, it's a good reason to share it. You know, for your CV, you could, you could whack up a shiny um, app or something on GitHub, or um, since we're all scientists, you could try to you could try to flog it off in a publication in some form. <laughs> if you well, think if you so think other perfect. people would be interested in it, um, there probably is is something there. Especially if these uh, I don't have a feel for it myself, but uh, if these methods that you're using in this experimental design are standard, uh, and and it's a common problem that people would come across to um, to um, have to decide transect length and and things like that. <laughs> But I, I have to go now. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, um, guys. You can carry on the discussion, and I'll uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks again. Bye, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Ed. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, guys. Who else have a question? Are, are there more questions, or we are just calling it a day? <laughs> I don't have any questions, but I thought it was really interesting. So thank you. Thank you. OK, guys. Well, I will work on that and we'll shout on on uh, on uh, Slack if uh, something new uh, arrives uh, from that field. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dan. I'm leaving too, and it was a pleasure to present for you. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks.